Chapter six part two of the Pathway of the Pioneer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain The Pathway of the Pioneer by Dolph Willard Chapter six part two Alma was at the height of her fever the next day, but the real danger did not lie there. Flair had nursed R. L. in distemper and had pulled him through, and to any one who had seen that heart-breaking disease in its worst form, the care and breathless attention required to save a patient who cannot even express his sufferings makes the nursing of a human being light in comparison she was not likely to fail in faithfulness but the battle did not really lie in her hands when the trained nurse arrived she proved to be a pleasant practical young woman who was sufficiently matter-of-fact to be deceived by flair's apparent stoicism and did not soften the facts of the case to her in consequence we shall pull her through the fever all right she said confidentially as they stood over the patient the question is whether she has the recuperative power to struggle back to life again they generally die of a relapse in these cases you see she has no reserve strength and the cough exhausts her terribly of course if she had not taken a chill on the fever she would have had a better chance she was all alone flair said with a difficulty the nurse did not grasp there was no one with her when she was first taken ill and she must have got out of bed in the delirium and walked about there was no one here she repeated blankly ah that was just it you see the doctor tells me that had it been a case of simple fever we might have called it influenza and there would have been no anxiety as it is she shrugged square practical shoulders that seemed to nudge flair's raw nerves with the movement she ought to be got out of london as soon as she can travel and have perfect rest at the seaside for how long said flair hopelessly fingering her post-office book in her own mind and seeing its dwindling figures oh if only she had not been so self-indulgent this past year as to draw any of the money she had so painfully put by a certain blue serge gown assumed the proportions of a monstrous crime though it had only cost two pounds making and all the ghost of the cheap claret too rose up as if suddenly proving its indigestible qualities and morally choked her well a fortnight might set her up if she rested a bit after coming back to town said the nurse critically looking down at the white face from which flair had plaited back the thick hair to avoid cutting it if possible on the stage isn't she she won't act for a month or so after this flair did not answer she was wondering what parish alma was in and whether she would get outdoor relief if she asked for it flair had always thought herself rather sinfully proud until that moment and she was very shy of clergymen because she was an occasional contributor to the agnostic journal and felt it written large all over her in their presence her religion lay too deep down for discussion and a sudden reference to any person of the trinity affected her with a sense of blasphemy that made her hot for the speaker but she had a desperate idea that one always appealed to the clergy of the parish in an urgent case and this matter was imperative she would in preference have borrowed from the doctor but his frayed shirt-cuffs and frankness on the subject of mutual poverty he did it to make flair feel herself an equal and unintentionally set up a barrier to confidences made her sensitive of even mentioning money difficulties to him indeed his bill was one of the nightmares that haunted her mattress on the floor and she reduced future expenditure rigidly in order to pay it it chanced that the nurse took her time off in the afternoon a few days later and went out to get some fresh air in preference to sleeping flair left the night work to her now and only sat with alma in the day for the work was slacker the patient having pulled through the fever as the nurse had prognosticated and only failing to regain strength flair sat by the bedside watching her scribbling verses as a recreation and talking a little while alma was awake she slept a great deal and it was hardly possible to gauge how much better or worse she was as it would have been with a more selfish patient because with her return to consciousness the old bright cheerfulness came back also and she never complained flair saw the nurse's final departure before her in a day or so for she dared not keep her longer 
than was strictly necessary and then came the moment when she ought to take alma away i shall begin putting your things to rights and packing up for you as soon as i have arranged where we will go she said with a confidence she did not feel in her despairing heart which dress-basket would you like to have emptied of its store of rubbish alma alma laughed weakly and coughed in consequence the smallest i think she said it is at the end of the bed there are only some bits and pieces and things in it oh said flair dryly well i will ask winnie if she knows a ragman who will take them away no don't i play old housekeepers in that black stuff skirt it's a splendid prop when can i see winnie or the others i am rather expecting frank round to-night and hilda left those grapes this morning when you were asleep come in it was the shapeless landlady puffing with a message and as usually vaguely incoherent there's a clergyman downstairs who wants to see you miss flair's heart leapt as to an answered prayer what a lucky thing that this good man had chanced to call on the humblest of his parishioners she could leave alma for a few minutes the nurse would be in soon hardly waiting to smooth her curly hair she ran downstairs to the empty front room where the landlady had shown the visitor with a due sense of his importance and entered without waiting to think that she was nervous but a sudden chill fell on her the instant she crossed the threshold either the dreary aspect of the unused room with its shiny leather furniture and closed windows shutting out god's fresh air or the aspect of the good man who awaited her and whom she had somehow pictured differently drove her back into her self-consciousness he was no doubt an excellent man according to his lights and he was undoubtedly a good parish priest to have sought out alma's case and to have heard of her illness but it was written in the book of fate that he should quench the smoking flax and break a bruised reed and he was one of those who give the unbeliever bitter occasion to scoff in appearance he was rather like a goat from his thin bony forehead to his straggling grey beard a goat with the burning eyes of the fanatic and a loud irresistible voice that beat itself in at flair's ears and never paused for answers perhaps he had grown so certain of being heard that to question it would have appeared to him a waste of time and he regarded his message as one which required no comment only reverent acceptance i am sorry to hear of our dear sister's danger he began in that loud voice flair stood still under the shock of it just inside the door where she had entered and looked at him seeing in her own mind the white cool bed upstairs and the roughened dark head and big eyes that represented alma to her it is terribly sad when the young are cut down like this but in the midst of life we are in death and we must all bow to his will the resonant words clanged like doom in flair's ears as she faced this dreadful man who was calmly consigning alma to the grave and ignoring any piteous effort to save her no doubt he had heard a very grave account from the doctor but the result was one his informant never foresaw and culminated in his next words is she a communicant would she like to see me certainly not the hard challenge of the clear voice did not seem to belong to flair she heard it herself with surprise and a feeling that had it been flung at her it would have driven her back upon herself as it certainly did the clergyman he was nonplussed but only for the moment not to-day then we will just pray to god for her he knelt down without any sense of inappropriateness to one of the horrible black leather chairs and in the same loud voice absolved and buried alma it seemed to flare without any allowance for hope she stood as if petrified in the same position inside the door glaring at the clergyman with the worst of all her expressions and without attempting to kneel also perhaps her stiff-necked lack of assent embarrassed him a little or perhaps even his fanaticism did not blind him sufficiently to attack her further with that look in her savage white face he rose when the prayer was ended and took up his hat making a stereotyped remark to the effect that he was glad to have seen her miss craik was her sister he supposed good-bye 
Flair looked at his outstretched hand and slowly raised her eyes to his face. Her courtesy did not fail her. She touched his fingers with one hand, while she opened the door with the other and bowed him out, not following him into the narrow hall, however, as the front door was just before him. The clergyman, like the doctor, carried away a vivid impression of Flair's personality. He thought she had the ugliest woman's face he had ever looked upon. Had he known that he had filled her with raging hate and scorn for his order, he would have been genuinely shocked and grieved. But the Church of England is a powerful body, though it has unwise ministers, and Flair's animosity was not likely to do it any harm. When she heard the front door shut her visitor out, the girl was still standing in the same position she had kept throughout the prayer. Suddenly a grim amusement seemed to strike her. She thought of the goat-like head and the priest's absurd posture before the absurd chair, and she glanced instinctively out of the closed window at a small lozenge of sky, which she could see between the roofs across the way, almost as if asking someone to share the joke. Flair's god was a gentleman with a sense of humor. There was no visible disturbance of her tranquillity when she returned to Alma, whom she found awake and inclined for milk in conversation. Alma took most of her nourishment as milk, and Flair, as she fed her, looked with a kind of wicked defiance at her thin face and hollow eyes. The clergyman's complacence over her friend's possible death had aroused her to contradiction. Why should Alma be calmly shifted out of life like that? Flair, said the object of her thoughts abruptly, did I talk a great deal of nonsense when I was ill? A great deal, replied Flair composedly. In particular, you were always assuring me that pretty little pink toes always go in silk hose. I don't know what it meant, and I greatly question its veracity, but I am sure it is part of a good and great poem. Do you happen to know any more? No, did I? Alma was stimulated by amusement, and her face gained a faint color. It is part of Molly was a milkmaid, which is the tenor solo in the piece I was in. I suppose I have lost my shop, Flair. A girl came here two days after you were taken ill, with a message from your manager, said Flair briefly. Fortunately, the doctor was here at the time, and she saw him. I have had no more trouble. Well, I am glad I am not going to be had up for breach of contract, said Alma, with her unflagging gift of regarding trouble from the point of view of a worse one that might have been. Who was the girl who came? Molly something. I forget. I didn't go to the theatre, because the last time I came behind to see you, a scene-shifter asked me to sit on his knee, or some little compliment of that kind, and I... I'm not used to it. The stage is a great leveller. It always makes me feel that I must have a proud stomach, not to be able to digest its equalities. I know it's awful. Alma's lips set, and she thought of the doorkeeper. I think panto is the worst experience you can have. I heard one girl cheek a man who was doing a special turn once. She was a little fool, for we all knew that he was a ruffian and a music-hall artist. But he made a rush at her and got her down. Before the company? Flair turned round, really breathless. Oh, yes, there were a lot of people about, so she was safe enough but it wasn't a nice situation for her. I made a rush, too, and twisted my hands in his collar until he let go. He was nearly choked, said Alma thoughtfully, looking at her weak fingers. Did you ever have trouble yourself? Not unless the men drank, because I was always on my guard. But one night a man I had never even spoken to before found me waiting behind the back cloth and asked me some question. I answered it as I should anyone's, and he said, Come and talk to me, and picked me up and carried me into his dressing room. It's a lawless world behind the footlights, said Flair thoughtfully. I should not keep an engagement a week. I know I should tell the manager himself what I thought of him. What did you do on the occasion of playing a Sabine woman, when that man used brute force? He was too strong for me to get away on the instant. But I fought like a tiger-cat, and when he put me down I bolted. I think I should have killed him if he had touched me again. I wonder why, thought Flair, looking at the distended pupils of her friend's eyes. 
for alma was generally rather reckless in anything like an adventure perhaps the big man was waiting at the stage door that night magda turned up in the course of the same evening full of plans and practical common sense she had heard of a kind of convalescent home in the isle of wight where certain certificates from a doctor would admit patients and their friends for a nominal sum she gave flair the address and advised her to write to her doctor that night and to the railway companies for passes you must write up the place tell them what you are on she said shrewdly i always do when i go for my holiday i choose a place on some line that will listen to my plea and work in return for my railway ticket that is only fair besides they will probably give you second class and that is easier for alma than going third i haven't done much of this kind of thing said flair knitting her brows most of my work is fiction you see never mind i can article as well as anything else i say magda she hesitated and spoke slowly suppose after all we cannot go to this place at all events never mind said magda callously even if the passes were wasted it wouldn't hurt the company and you can read up the place and write the article anyhow if your honesty is troubled flair wrote her letters and made her preparations even wallowing in shabby clothes and theatrical odds and ends in alma's dress-basket over which she groaned but her mind was at stretch all the time to think how she was to earn or borrow even the small sum that would cover their holiday alma could not go alone which would have reduced expenses and her own small resources were strained to meet the immediate necessities of the illness for she was expecting a big check and her present money had nearly run out most of flair's income was earned in freelance journalism which meant gnawing anxiety between periods of comparative safety if she could see her way three months ahead she did not trouble much but she was obliged to depend on certain manuscripts being accepted which were almost a certainty but not quite and in the meantime eke out what money she actually had there are certain fiction publishing firms which accept manuscripts at once and pay on production though that may be eighteen months hence others whose system flair liked better which keep the author waiting six months for a decision but pay at once when they have accepted work she was waiting for one of these acceptances now and had not much doubt about it but in the meantime she wanted five pounds if she got the railway passes she calculated that five pounds would cover hers and alma's board and lodging and all minor expenses for the fortnight but she had almost come to the desperate expedient of getting the sum made up among nous autres a strain she knew she ought not to lay on already overburdened shoulders she was still awaiting an answer from the railway companies when an unexpected angel met her in the byways of life so closely disguised that had he not been the undoubted bringer of relief she would have denied his claim to be a messenger of heaven though god chooses strange almoners for his charities from the very first his appearance in such a character appeared so doubtful that flair almost declined to see him for his advent was announced to her by the landlady almost in the same words that had preceded the ghastly interview with the clergyman there's a gentleman downstairs wants to see you miss who is it said flair sharply under her breath for alma was asleep i'm sure i don't know miss he didn't give no name said the landlady with an indignant sniff it was clear that she disdained any agency in the situation for she began to descend the stairs heavily one flat foot placed over another to mark her disappearance flair watched the shapeless body out of sight with a wry smile then she glanced at alma sleeping peacefully on her pillows with the happy ease of a child and with war in her heart and bland expectancy on her lips flair shut the door softly and went down to the front room of the last memorable visit there was no one visible for the first moment of her entrance and she was some way into the room before she discovered the unexpected vision of a big man in a big overcoat for the evening was chilly 
with a big personality that checked her she had come swiftly meaning to dismiss her visitor with scant ceremony after her last experience but as he turned she hesitated waiting to be sure of her ground before making her attack the big man put down a hat and stick on the centre table amongst the worsted mats and gilt prize books with which it was decorated and came straight across the room to flare i hear miss craik is ill he said coming to the point in a voice that matched his person it was so good to listen to in its chest notes that flare's animal instincts made her draw a shade nearer instead of standing aloof are you a friend of hers yes i am helping to nurse her is she very ill there was no hesitation from knowing what he had come to learn but flare looked up quickly and reassuringly not now she said she is through the fever not unless she has a relapse i want to get her away the words came with a breathless rush and her strained face waited to see what would happen she had not got so far as this even with the doctor can i do anything said the big man simply could you lend me five pounds said flare looking at him through the dusk he seemed very big and she knew that he would not hurt two weaker things even mentally his size seemed to make it easy to speak straight out for some intangible reason yes i can he said rather abruptly it is probable that he also was feeling the strain and it is difficult for a man to explain to any woman how much he wants to help without blundering even to so impersonal and unfeminine a creature as flare appeared i brought some with me in case he felt in a big pocket and brought out a pocket-book from whose depths he took a bank-note which he put silently into her hand she was still looking up at him and there was nothing horrible at all in her eyes they were only flooded with kindness and as gentle as they were for r l or alma in her illness she moved a step nearer without touching him at all and her voice made him wince as tears would not have done thank you very much i'll give it you back you know don't hurry over that he said huskily and look here that address will find me let me know if you want any more we shan't said flare courageously this will do for the fortnight it would go farther but you see there are two of us and i can't let her go alone i see he spoke as if only half listening and glad to get away now that his errand was done flare followed him out of the room and opened the front door for him hovering at heel like a little dog good night he said lifting his hat in the dark chilly street then he looked at the clever unhealthy face framed in the open doorway and paused i forgot to ask your name good-bye said flare with a prophecy i am flare caldicott she began to write verses even as she reascended the stairs a sure sign with her that some stimulant had made the thin blood run redder in her veins when alma awoke flare was busily clearing out the bottom of the dress basket and doing up the motley contents into bundles preparatory to packing alma's clothes what on earth are you doing said alma sleepily it seems to be the middle of the night i am finding revelations of your character in the rubbish that you collect said flare with an unusual bubble of enjoyment in her tone all my respect for you has suddenly ceased since i found you the unhappy possessor of nine pairs of disgraceful gloves five dirty old neckties and one white pill i don't know what any of these things appertain to any more than i do the countless drugs which i have packed into the empty tin boxes you seem to collect as a connoisseur where it was possible i have done the things up in bundles to await your decision through a vicious desire that you yourself should deal with them i couldn't get that pill into the tin boxes by the way it lived in a house so much too large for it that i was obliged to pack it separately so it remains a dingy monument to some former disease of yours of which i know nothing i think what i resented most was finding one of my own photos amongst a pile of undarned stockings alma lay in bed and laughed feebly till the tears stood in her eyes after which flare abandoned her packing and gave over the room to the nurse who came in to take up her duty 
at the door she turned and looked back at alma as if casually we are going to the isle of wight next week alma she said please get over all your milk drinking and sleeping before we start as i decline to have a holiday with either a calf or a sluggard good night i'm going to bed but she did not go to bed she sat down in the further room which the landlady had grudgingly let to her to finish the verses the rage of composition being upon her and when she had finished she still sat there a few minutes and instead of reading or correcting her work as was her wont she thought of the big man and was comforted i wonder said flair to an inscrutable world how it is that alma can do that sort of thing and be none the worse for it if winnie attempted it she would go farther and fare worse perhaps or if i god forbid but i could not have accepted the money in any case but alma's it was very still and warm and green upon the cliffs and there was a smell of honeysuckle and hay there together with the breath of the sea that crawled lazily over the rocks some thirty feet below alma lay on her side in a shelving nook with a vile panama hat tilted over one eye absorbing a little more sunshine into her being and with all the isle of wight for a background flair was smoking in direct defiance of ruskin and as usual making verses it was like the land of beulah a breathing space in the pilgrimage flair said alma sleepily i will write in for the cowboy it's going on tour in september i found quite exciting things in the era this morning did you said flair absently the last line did not scan and she hunted for a shorter word to carry her meaning yes do you think i shall be able to starve on until then i had a cheque for fifty pounds this morning flair roused herself to explain you can have half that's twenty-five each no it's only twenty-two ten because i owe five pounds she added thoughtfully i can't live on you said alma quickly i must get special weeks you will do nothing of the sort said flair composedly even if i have to rake out your aunt fanny and appeal to her or go to the actor's benevolent fund look at my verses alma and see what you think of them she leaned forward and put a sheet of blotted writing into alma's hand flair hated showing her verses but it was necessary to create a diversion the battle of the new age read alma the men came down from the mountains and the women came up from the plains the path through the crags was level and the valley was heavy with rains there was neither justice nor pity for wherever the foe might lurk the men had a great tradition and the women were new to the work yet they struck far into the future and shut their ears to the past and the pain and the wound of the present were nothing but blood at the last the men had the city to squander the joy of the field and the tent and nobody knew but the women what the battle really meant god stayed his laws for the contest while the angels held their breath and the red tide rose to the armpits and the struggle to live was death and the battle pealed to the mountains while day stood stark in the sky and the men looked on to the triumph and the women looked on to die they fought for the sake of the others they struck for an unknown end where every face was a lover's and every foe was a friend they fought both swordless and hopeless they saw where the death must strike and nobody knew but the women what dying for nothing was like god said they have wiped out eden i have nothing left to forgive and when the battle was over the women had died to live what does it mean alma asked slowly is it nous autres? yes i began it when you were ill a kind of rage came over me when i thought what a fight we had and how everything is made easy for men and then they run us down for even trying to make our own living i like them said alma simply referring to the verses where every face was a lover's and every foe was a friend they will never get into print said flair 
and i tried to console myself for failures by saying that verse doesn't pay after all on the few occasions when i have published any i have generally been sent a cheque for about seven and six why don't you write a play said alma to whom all things were theatrical she loved the profession which had nearly killed her with the infatuation of all its victims so that its very drawbacks became advantages compared with any other to her mind alma chafed when she was out for long not only on account of money but through being actually homesick for the sounds and sights of a theatre she heartily enjoyed the fortnight in the island for she was only convalescent and the joy of coming back to life was a natural and healthy instinct in her happy nature but she fretted over the idle time in london that followed and snatched at the first opportunity of work so that in august she took the special week she had talked of and played in an old favourite on the south side of london to a roaring audience it was a wet stormy evening on which she went back into business but the outside world seemed to lie miles and miles away from the footlights and was forgotten in the hot crowded house alma almost pranced when she found herself back in the dressing-room again with the familiar whitewashed walls the pegs for the dresses and the theatrical sheet covering them the grease paints on the long line of tables the slovenly dresser the chatter of the other girls as they made up she was playing a boy's part and all the madness of her excitement had scope to work itself out in the play new business came to her like an inspiration and she got laugh after laugh for her unexpected pranks and sallies such a night as this was worth all the illness and the waiting and the anxiety if only for the coming back to life and the reaction of variety and movement after monotony she felt intoxicated with her own vitality and yet stepped aside even in the midst of it all to help a fellow-worker and so won herself a blessing to crown her happiness one of the actresses who was playing a subordinate role was a married woman with a child five years old who poor mite was allowed to come on in one scene as an extra attraction to the gallery who wept over her as the representation of childhood but were by no means so sentimental over the fact that she was being kept up night after night and losing her health and the sleep her poor little body needed the mother was ailing and had tried to get excused from appearing in the last act amongst a crowd of supers which was all that she had to do but a brutal stage manager declined to have her released for the sake of a private grudge the baby who was shrewd beyond her years confided the whole matter to miss craik and alma must as needs turn champion as draw her breath she had played her own part so well that the manager himself sauntered into the dressing-room to congratulate her he did so with the familiarity of tradition and alma passed the intrusion because she had a boon to ask mr lee can mrs benson go home after the second act she demanded her cough is frightful and she has only to walk on with the crowd in the bridal scene i suppose so said the manager carelessly that's a good make-up of yours dear yes said alma hastily shrinking slightly from the hand on her shoulder and wondering whether she would be wise to excuse herself and run but mr prentice won't excuse her mr lee can't you speak to him what a little partisan you are said the manager with a good-humoured laugh but he was pleased with alma and could afford to extend his favour further he sent mrs benson a glass of port wine with her permission to leave and settled the stage manager and mrs benson seeking for the cause of her salvation traced it to alma craig alma had particular reason for hurrying away from the theatre that night and scrambled from her successful make-up and her boy's dress into mufti as soon as she got her final exit cue she was running down the passage to the stage door when mrs benson breathless stopped her oh miss craig i want to thank you i hear it was you who got me let off i'm going home now and god bless you dear she added unsteadily that's all right mrs benson 
i just had a chance to speak to mr lee said alma brightly good night good night nelly she added to the child and catching up her skirts prepared to leave the lights and the noise of the theatre for the dripping side street there was no need for her to put up an umbrella however for outside on the pavement was the figure of a big man with a large one already up who offered his arm to her in silence oh said alma slipping her small hand into it and seeming to be swallowed up from that moment in the big man's masculine strength and protection the little child had followed alma to the doorway and now stood on the threshold waving a tiny hand and imitating her mother's farewell in her own baby fashion dood night miss cake dod bess you alma turned her face quickly with a radiance on it warmer than a smile to catch the blessing even as the big man led her safely away and so she went out into the darkness and the rain End of chapter 6